Good afternoon, I am Pete, also known as Risk for Rewards, or on Twitter, at Risk for Rewards. Uh, currently got around 14,000 followers over there, and we're closing in on 1,000 subscribers here on YouTube. As you've seen in the last week or so, uh, plenty of content's gone up on YouTube uh, rather than Twitter, and there'll probably be plenty more coming up for the festival, and then obviously Aintree Grand National and Punchestown. I'm trying to do a few more videos because it's quicker and I can get general content out. Um, and then the detail and the statistics and stuff, they'll all come out close to the festival um, written on my blog. So if you're looking for my Cheltenham blog, if you go to my Twitter, at Risk for Rewards, um, if you click the blog there, you'll be able to find uh, any selections I've had in the last 12 months and um, any sort of insights and thoughts of, of the process of how I bet towards the festival. Um, coming up to the festival on the Sunday beforehand, so obviously the festival starts on Tuesday, on that Sunday, my festival blog will be released and that will cover all 28 races with stats, analysis, um, pointers for which horses you should look out for for the 2024 festival, who you could bet prior to the race um, and any sort of insights I've got. Uh, last year was over 30,000 words. It's already at over 25,000, so it could end up bigger than um, last year. But obviously quality, uh, hopefully over quantity. Um, it's not all about just putting words on a page. But yeah, if you follow over on Twitter and then that will be out and that will be free to everyone um, close to the festival. Um, but today is the final video, so of the fifth video. Um, and the first uh, four have gone down very well with the comments and uh, replies and the likes on uh, here on YouTube. So I appreciate that. Um, and today we're covering Friday, so the Friday of the Cheltenham Festival. Um, again, it's exactly the same as the other three videos I've done covering the Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. It's just a brief outlook on a few horses, the pointers that they're going, if there was a non-runner, if someone was to get injured, which way I may lean in the market, um, any antipost you may want to take now, and just my thoughts on a few of the runners that we've already backed in the race. So we'll get straight to it. And we've got obviously Friday is the Triumph Hurdle. So going into the Dublin Race Festival, I'd imagine the majority of people thought this is just going to be an absolute shoe-in. Lossy Mouth will probably be odds on by the time you finish the Dublin Race and Festival. And this would be an easy race to talk through. Um, whilst I still am fairly at, at that sort of thought process, um, there's just a lot more to it now. Obviously, Lossy Mouth came over from France with a huge lofty reputation. Um, she actually ran on the same card as Blood Destiny. They ran over the same course and distance on the same day. Lossy Mouth wasn't getting weight that day. Um, she was running off level, so they both ran off the same weight as well. The race, the first race was Blood Destiny versus Bo Zenith. Um, Blood Destiny actually finished behind Bo Zenith. But Bo Zenith's time um, was around, I think it was two seconds or three seconds faster than Lossy Mouse on the day. So it was a faster time, basically, um, carrying off levels. So, But either way, all three of them got snapped up for big connections and moved over to the UK. So it's just going to show that there's not a lot between Blood Destiny and Lossy Mouth, even though that was their debuts, just on raw talent. They clearly have, they're very closely matched. Obviously, she gets the £7 mayor's allowance, and they've both done very different things since. Um, they're both at very different profiles as well. So we'll we'll start with Lossy Mouth because I've already touched on her. So Lossy Mouth came over. She was very raw on debut, but she had no issue in... Zarek the Brave had looked very good, um, and so had Comfort Zone. Um, and she swept both of them aside, who had race fitness and experience over the hurdles. She went three, four wide the whole race, swept them, swept past, and just went past them like they were stood still, won very easily. Um, she then came out around Leopardstown at Christmas time and did exactly the same again. So a similar feel, but in second that time was Galan Marceau. Um, that horse was very keen on the day um, and uh, was running for its first start for Willie Mullins. Um, it didn't really look like there was much in it. Lossy Mouth just put her away. I think it was over five lengths. She won very easily going away. And you went to the Dublin Race Festival expecting the exact same formality. Galan Marceau to follow her home. But obviously, as we all know, the Dublin Race Festival, it was an absolute nightmare. The 125-1 to 1 pacemaker managed to... Lossy Mouth was in the perfect position coming into the bend, but obviously was too close to the pacemaker. And then between the pacemaker and um, Lossy Mouth, the town end and I think it was Jack Foley, didn't manage to get their words mixed up. However, they've done it, and they basically landed on top of each other. And the pacemaker's fallen into a heap, as you'd probably expect with a 100-plus um, shot. And But she's taken... <coughs> taken a uh, lossy mouth all the way back through the field and the issue was if you'd done that on the first circuit or earlier on in the race then you'd have had plenty of time to say okay right let's just slowly work the way back especially with her high cruising speed but it was it couldn't have been at a more um, awkward stage just as the race was hotting up 
So obviously she got sent all the way to the back, shuffled all the way to the back. And meanwhile, instead, Galan Marceau took up that perfect prominent role. Um, and Danny Mullins on cloud nine, as it was, riding out of his skin throughout the whole weekend, he took the opportunity with both hands and he rode it home. Um, Paul Tannen was still fairly confident. Like he didn't get hard into her coming around the bend and she was making up ground, obviously going four wide around the whole field. Um, and when they got into the straight, uh, she was pushing, pushing. Uh, she was pushed along by Town, and it was like one of those making his mind up. Um, and she closed the gap, but then she just couldn't get any closer than a couple of lengths. Um, so for me personally, um, I I think Lossie Mouth will turn that form around. But I've seen plenty, a bit like the Banbridge Mighty Potter situation. I've seen many judges come out and say they think Gallimasso is worth it for that distance. The thing for Gallimasso is that a lot of people were taking this saying, oh, on a second run for Mullins, she'll be um, second run hurdling, she'll be more settled. But that was her, I think it's her seventh run of her career. So she's a lot more exposed than the front two, Blood Destiny and Lossie Mouth. Like that was her second run for Mullins, but not her second run of her career. So she has got plenty of racing under her belt. She's more experienced than these. So she should know better, but she's just pulling so hard. She was so keen in that race yet again. And she just, in, in effect, she pulled her chance away, but she didn't pull her chance away because in third was Takao, who you saw the jockey looking around thinking, Jesus, lost him out, get past me quick. You're wrecking my boodles, Mark, here. He couldn't have gone any wider, the old round the outside five deep. Um, and then as soon as, obviously, lost him out, went past, he's like, oh, okay, I'll give her a token, give Takao a token nudge just to keep him going to the line. So the form in behind is questionable with plenty of willies, stuff like Gust of Wind having their first run, having not ran for him. So I think, in, a, in effect, you look at it, and it was a two-horse race with Takao not interested. And Gallimasso got the perfect run on Lossie Mouth. But again, she did not settle. So whilst they say at Cheltenham, they're like, it'll be a stronger pace, bigger field, she'll settle. She could well do, but like this will be coming on to I'm sure it's her eighth run now. And like why is she suddenly going to settle? I understand some horses do settle for the faster pace and stuff, but she she doesn't, she doesn't look like she was, she was about four deep into the field. And... They, weren't, they were hardly dawdling, um, and she just doesn't seem to be one a horse that wants to settle. So for me, that's a massive question mark going into Cheltenham, because it's not a place where you want to be going and not settling. Does she have a chance? Of course she does. However, Lossy Mouth, I'd understand if I was looking at Lossy Mouth at four to six, um, and Gala Marceau at, say, eight to one, but you're not. Lossy Mouth is anywhere from seven to four to two to one, and probably on the day you may well get two to one, depending on how Mullins' is week's gone. So between those two, it's easily Lossy Mouth's camp for me, um, of those two. Um, comfort zone, obviously beaten by Lossy Mouth, but it's clearly improved since, won both the English trials. Um, and goes here as a player, but I find it hard to see turning that form around, giving the weight away to Lossy Mouth. And even if he does, he's then got stable mate Blood Destiny to contend with. So Blood Destiny's had a complete opposite tri- um, a complete opposite path to the other two, Lossy Mouth and Gala Marceau. And the fact that he's been running against the Boodles candidates instead. So he hasn't stepped into all the triumph, into the deep water. But what he's been doing is very good on the clock, visually, and good sectionals. So he scattered the field on debut with no issues whatsoever. And then he had the most questionable run last time out when, at the start, they gave him a free, easy five lengths. And the field didn't look interested at all. He must have been probably 15, 20 lengths clear at one stage. And then I don't know whether Townend gave him a breather or whether they just eventually ate into his lead. But they got close coming round um, two, two in, um, uh, two out, sorry. And uh, But he jumped two out and then he just cleared away and, and went going away, winning further again. But like the horses in behind, like the horse that he beat the time before was that, um, uh, what's it called? I, is it I, not I Care, Alan. Um, horse that, two seconds, apologies. <laughs> Um, Sir Allen, sorry. So he beat Sir Allen the time before. Um, and Sir Allen's done the form good in uh, winning twice uh, since. And there's only, obviously, the only defeat has come from that. But Sir Allen's racing against horses like Biker, as I mentioned on Tuesday, where Biker was clearly looking for a handicap mark for the Boodles. As would, I think Sir Allen was one of those in the moment horses. I think they wanted the wins. Um, but my point is, they're not looking to get close to Blood Destiny. So basically, you're back in Blood Destiny based on the trainer's comments, the trainer's ability to get a horse to this level. Obviously, haven't won it last year with Vorban, and he's won it quite a few times in the past. Um, but comes in at a very different angle to the two mares. And obviously, Blood Destiny has to give the £7. 
So fortunately, we're on lossy map at 16 to 1 from the start of the season. And Blood Destiny, I put up at 6 to 1 non runner, no bet, um, just to have on side as well. And for me, they're the two that I want in the race. I looked through some of the UK. I know there's been a lot of love for this St. Donats, um, but there's collateral form where St. Donats was well beaten by McTeague and stuff, and it leaves St. Donats with plenty to find. But they have said that was an off off day race like us and that was a nothing so forget that but this St. Donats was 33 to 1 not long ago and they've said this wasn't the main pr uh, prime target they've got things they want to do in France so they said they may come here but a few judges have put them up and now it's got shorter and shorter and now a 16s I can see but probably even shorter non runner no bet so I just think looking through you've got Gus of Wind who obviously ran very little race to cows going to the Boodles Bo Zinnith even though he won on the weekend I mean that's not the sort of form that wins a triumph unless he improves another like 20 pounds um, in the next three weeks um, script writers the English challenge but I can't be having him <clears throat> especially the fact he's beat by comfort zone who's beat by lossy mouth so for me it is between the front three in the market and with the question marks around Gallimarso and I'll be disappointed if the form can't get turned around lossy mouth gets the eight pounds so I think the market's got it right, but I do think it'll be Lossy Mouth and Blood Destiny will be the um, it'll be one of those. And obviously on an anti post, but there's not a lot I can help with um, to people who haven't backed. But finding a way to get those on side would be um, my two. Um, going on to the county hurdle, so obviously this is a much more interesting race for um, price wise. Um, I have put two horses up in this. I know obviously the last few videos I've not actually mentioned um, to I haven't mentioned too many um, handicaps, hard and fast bets that I've had. I, there's two horses I like in this. The first one that I like is Filey Bay. Filey Bay is obviously not going to go under the radar being a JP McManus horse, um, expensive purchase, and sent to M. McMullins, went two for two, couldn't see his second run because it was in the fog, so we physically couldn't see how good the horse was. But obviously there was no hiding away from how he travelled through the Betfair hurdle. Absolutely sluiced through the field. Um, that was obviously over the two-mile trip and looked the winner everywhere but the line. Like people were questioning the ride. Like I thought the ride was perfect. Came through the pack, was settled the whole way through. Just a few novice jumps here and there, and obviously, most importantly, a novice jump when you really needed it most at the second last. I think if he'd cleared the second last well, he would have won going going away, and everyone would be like, and then he would have, but his his weight would have gone up a lot further. So, I just think it's hard not to. Obviously, that was only his third run for Emmett Mullins, um, and with further improvements come further experience. He may bump into one that's got, say, 10 or £20 pounds ahead or whatever, but you don't know what they've left on to work with. And I know some people like each way, some don't, but he was 10 to 1. I'm not sure. Right, I'll tell you what price he is now. So he's now 8 to 1. Like It's hard to see him not being in the first few. If you're an each way player, you may want to wait until the day. Obviously, I most of my bets anti posted are win only because I don't want to give away the place part if the horse is a non-runner. So I can back each way if I want to on the day. But... I find it hard to see how he doesn't go close. He's gone up, he went up six pounds Irish mark. So, but he's now on officially, he's on 137. So he was on, he was on 133 last time, uh, UK mark. Um, and I think he went about six pounds Irish mark. So he's probably, he's probably going to end up around 140, I think 139. So last year, 134 to 152 was the, um, the level that you needed to be at. So he's going to get in off, not bottom weight, but he's not going to get in off a high weight. So he's probably going to be about probably five pounds off the bottom weight. So I, th I think he's going to have a very good chance again. And what the thing that swayed it for me here is the fact that on the day um, he had uh, Donna Mailer on, on board. who give it an absolute corking ride, don't get me wrong, but that's not a claimer. If you can get a claimer who's well worth their seven pound allowance, that seven pound allowance then negates the say six pounds that they that they put him up for his county hurdle run. So he's gained the experience. Um, he's got a run under his belt. So because he'd been off seventy days, and he's then got a seven pound allowance. So he's either going to be racing off the same weight or a little bit lower, or he could get a five pound claimer. Um, and uh, so he'll be off that same mark. I, I find it hard to see how he's not going to go close. That in, in my opinion, but the market is slowly catching. When I say slowly, the market is catching on to that. But I just think I could easily see him going off like five to one on the day. Um, so he's one that I backed. And the other one that I put up the other day was Pembroke at 16 to one. <clears throat> Problem is with Pembroke was that once the handicap marks come out, I saw Paul Ferguson put up on Twitter about the, all the current marks. 
and there was a few comments that he'd made about Pembroke and being a county. I thought, okay, yeah, I'll have a look at that. And then there was a newsletter went out and Mark Howard had made a few comments. I thought, right, I've got that one in, in the bag to like, have a look at. And I looked at it and thought, yep, yeah, okay, I agree, I agree. But with handicaps, <clears throat> you always want to wait until as close as possible um, to know what the trainer's plans are. And, and the, the prices don't generally change because obviously we don't get the weights. The weights for the handicaps are, I think the Irish go in uh, today, which I'm recording this on the Monday, and then the English go in tomorrow and then we'll get them released next week. We don't actually have all the marks yet. Um, so people don't look to bet heavily in the handicaps and go too hard into the races. But the issue was that this horse got put up on up in the ante. Um, and it was a, a, a brilliant, um, obviously, it's a, I think it's obviously a brilliant choice. But the issue was that it then I had to then put it up on Twitter straight away because you're pretty much exposed for um, the price The price is going to be going. Um but the main the main reason for me why I like this horse was the fact that each year, if you look past, if you look at my blogs in the past, I've always targeted a Skelton and a Mullins horse. Generally, I know I've tar targeted Emmett Mullins this year, um, but I could end up having a couple more, three or four bets in the race anyway. Um, but Willie Mullins and uh, Dan Skelton have made this a benefit over the last uh, over the last six seven years. Uh, I think over the last seven contests, I think they've got three apiece. Um, so obviously Pembroke is a Dan Skelton horse and you look back through his form and uh, he's his form through <clears throat> he's got form figures of just progressive form all the way up but the, the main issue was for me was that he'd looked impressive when bolting up um, over Magic Wave which the form wasn't fantastic and then he bolted up again but on the uh, when he when he went to Cheltenham for the 28th of Jan Skelton was asked before like do you think he's going to win and it and he was very, very confident, like very bullish, like almost overly bullish. Um, and even after the race, he said, I wouldn't like change my decision. I did think he was going to win, but it was fairly obvious on the day that he got beaten by a horse that stayed a lot better. And that horse was Rock My Way. He would finish by um, behind um, uh, We've All Been Caught of Sam uh, Nigel Twiston Davies' horse, who looked at our three-mile candidate before flopping at the DRS. So the form's got a solid substance to it. Um, and he did everything right, travelled, he had a double handful the whole race, and it was a question of how far. Like, I haven't been through, but if you looked on the exchanges, I'm sure he would have hit a very short price in running. And he come, he came round to, uh, to the hill and rocked my way, gained a little bit of a lead, um, but he just couldn't eat into it. He just That lead just maintained the whole way up the straight. He, and it was one of those, you needed the, the leader to make a slight mistake like a hurdle just to gain that slight advantage and rock my way, just got the rail and was like, see you later and just kept going all the way up the hill. Um, but the thing that that marked out was, there was two things that stood out massively, which is why he was such an eye catcher. There was one, obviously, because he'd been beaten when everyone was expecting him to win, what was going to happen with his handicap mark? Um, obviously, because it was his fourth run um, and his handicap mark is actually untouched. So he sat there on 136. 136 is two pounds above um, what the lowest mark was last year and would get him into all of the um, county hurdles in the last six, seven years. So he will get in at almost bottom weight. The other massive consideration is the fact the step back to two miles. So obviously he drops back from two mile four back to two miles and the way he was travelling all over and the fact that he's got the ticks in the box with the victories, his career RPR 140 was um, over two miles. And obviously the final thing is the fact that one, we know how good... Dan Skelton is at targeting a handicap. And um, two is the fact that um, we now know that he's going there. So it has been released that um, this is the aim for um, Pembroke. Um, Pembroke still sat there at 12 to 1, and I think that's more than fair. For a, for a trainer who's won this three times in the last seven years, you know that he's come out in his stable tour, said the horse is going there. You know the step back and trip's going to suit. Um, he's probably going to get better ground, even though he's won on heavy regardless. Um, and I, I just find it hard to see reasons to why what's not in his favour for him to go close. So, yeah, I think Pembroke in the county hurdle is um, a, another strong fancy for me. So that's Filey Bay and Pembroke. I've backed both of those. Obviously, they've been up on Twitter a while um, and they won't be changing. Um, on to the Albert Bartlett. So I'm going to be brief on this, not because I don't think it's a good race, just because it's a race I never touch anti-post. Because you just generally, in my opinion... You get burnt, you get wide open fields. It's a bit like an old school gold cup where generally the field will be minimum four to one in the field. And when it's not, 
like say you've got a Bells Hill or whatever at six to four, they find a way to get beat. Like Mullins very rarely sends his his classy like his best novices to three miles because even if he really like even if he really likes them, he doesn't want to be sending them over such a trip. He likes to keep them at the short trips, even if he thinks they could be a three mile chaser. Every now and again, you get like a monkfish, like something that's clearly like setting the world alight over that trip that just you just have to go that way. But generally, like and you look through the front of this market and there's Embassy Gardens, who's at the front of the market, and like that to me is just absolutely bonkers. Like he. he he won last time out and the race absolutely fell apart. Fell into his lap. Yeah, he won on the bridle. He looked impressive, but that is recency bias at its best. Like, I'd be shocked. Like, obviously, I'll hold my hands up. Yeah, people give you abuse all the time for for being too strong on something. I'll get, but I'd be shocked if this horse wins um, the Albert Bar. And that won't change in my blog. Like, I will state, like, it's not a horse that I've got any interest in backing. And he's favourite at six to one. Like, and I think he's been put there by default favourite because of his trainer. Um, so the reason I don't punt is for things like the Hidden Valley Lake situation where Hidden Valley Lake looked really good on debut um, but then they, you don't see the horse for like two, three months so they went through the same race they targeted it with the Manella Indo and, but the difference was with Manella Indo they put like it was like it was tailor made, let's go, all of this sort of thing whereas they decided to run a stable mate so they put Hidden Valley Lake and Monty Star both of those two ran Hidden Valley Lake, therefore, I had to give the weight to Monty Star. And both of them ran an absolute cracker. So, like, a really good, like, trial for something like an Albert Bartlett or something over the trip going forwards. But they've done that literally five days ago. So now, three and a half weeks out from the festival, they've both had an absolute grueler by their own horses in their own yard. Like, I just, it, I really struggle to get my head around some, some logical thought to why you've, like, Hidden Valley Lakes have one run so far this season. So unless they've had an issue at home, they've then left, let off this horse, prepped it up, ready to come for a nice little prep there, and then obviously go on to the festival. But now, like if you'd had this race, say, at Christmas time, you'd be like, oh, that horse has got to be a major player. Both of those two would be, be on your radar. But now my thought is, how will they come out of that run? Why did they have like three months off after his first run? But now he's only going to have four weeks after this run. I think as well with Albert Bartlett horses, a lot of trainers are happy to run them here to get a bit of experience. But then going going forward, um, uh, going forward, it's uh, more for the three mile chase situation. They're not losing any sleep if they don't win an Albert Bartlett. If that makes sense, it's brilliant for the owners and the trainers on the day. But they're not worried. Like if you run a cracker and you run second or third, and they're like, "That's a brilliant three mile chaser coming up." And then next year you're like an RSA horse or whatever. Then that's that's what they're they're all in for. So and I look through the field and like I think there's quite a lot of much muchness like three card brag lost a few won a few managed to win last time out but me personally I think obviously as we've seen um, since uh, that horse of Willie Mullins is no uh, Spanish Harlem like they were trying to get that handicapped and it got beat again like that doesn't look any sort of well beat or even if that's in a handicap doesn't look like it's going to win so three card brag is one of those that always seems to get there last as in like as in always looks like it's going to get there but doesn't get there. Um, so it's, it's just a race that I'm just going to take an easy pass on and then come close to the time. It's normally one that I, I won't have had a selection in and I'll do it on Wednesday or Thursday night. I want to know ground conditions, how horses have ran. Because you've got to remember as well is you don't have to solve everything overnight. So like, say if you went in there and I don't know, a certain horse won the Supreme, say say Goodland won the Ballymore and it gave a, and three car brag finished. Okay, here's a prime one. Say in the pocket won the Ballymore. Obviously, three card brag finished just in behind in the pocket, staying on. So then, come the Albert Bartlett, you're like, well, that's actually really good form now. So there is no rush. So like from the Supreme or the Ballymore, you may get some good pointers from horses that have finished in front. The only thing is, you've got to have that in your mind and ready to go before, as in as soon as that happens. Because if you catch it, say an hour or two hours, like in the heat of the festival. You're like, okay, I remember three car bag got beat by that. Back that horse for the Albert Bartlett because that was just bolted up in the Ballymore. You've got to be faster than the bookmakers. They won't react on the day straight away, but come the evening, once the compilers get into it, they'll be like, hang on a minute, later on in a week, three car brag did this to that horse. Let's put him in at four to one now. So you will lose those prices. But at the same time, for a bigger picture, shorter price, often you're going to get more winners. So I'm never in a rush with the Albert Bartlett. So what's supposed to be a short, quick explanation, I ended up too far. Onto the Gold Cup, the Gold Ribbon, the race that everyone absolutely loves. I, in the past, I used to not be the biggest fan of the Gold Cup just because I thought it was such a hard race to solve. 
Um, plenty of horses always got beat in it. And, and it is still, it's a brilliant race. So competitive. And that two furlongs extra does catch so many horses out. But I'm going to try and skim through these as quick as possible from the top downwards. Um, Manella Indo uh, showed good form, obviously, when beating Statler, but was getting eight pounds. Um, has good form in the Gold Cup itself, but isn't getting any younger. I find it hard to see him winning. Could run a good race at 20 to 1. Hewick would not be one on my radar whatsoever. Um, if he wins, then I'm sure it would be a great story, but it's not for me. Protector at, I find it too hard to forgive that last run. Skelton's a target trainer, and he targeted the Betfair chase to perfection. Um, I thought, to be honest, that they'd do that, then they might have a little quiet run of Christmas, and then, uh, like, target again, have, like, three months and go for it, like the Betfair chase. But, like, Skelton even looked afterwards, he looked a little bit, I think, well, he, he did say afterwards, he said, I expected to win that. And I'm not surprised when he looks at what he's got beaten by. Um, he travelled well for, like, 75% of the race. I just don't think you win Gold Cups coming into it on those sort of preps. But at the same time, the Gold Cup is a race in itself. It's very unique. And some horses need to... He could come on 120% for that, and then he's a big player. But the fact that he was beaten last year by uh, Aplutard and Manella Indo, um, he's got work to do on that anyway. And I think it's a lot better when you're going when you're in your first year stepping into the Gold Cup frame or you're coming back having finished, like as in retaining the title. Um, Conflated is an interesting one, a bit of a dark horse as a player, um, but it, just not for me. I would hold my hand up and say it's just not for me. Um, the fact that they've had the debate with Ryanair and not, and I just think he's impressive. It reminds me a bit of Delta work. Impressive in the Irish Gold Cup and then comes here and I could easily see him finding one too, one too good here. It's a different class of horses beating horses like Kenboy. Um, Hoy Senor has just been a nightmare, really, for, for many. And fair play to Connections. They stuck with him and they said, look, we're doing this. We're not going to stay as early. We're not doing that. We're just going to run him until he, he regains. And I don't know whether the horse is like a little bit dopey or like whether he lacks fitness or intelligence. Like He just came back for the first time. And when he took on um, a Brave Man's Game in the Charlie Hall, and he was sent off favourite that day, like he literally looked like he'd never seen a fence before. He couldn't jump, he didn't travel, and obviously he was pretty much pulled up. And then it was very similar the next time out, uh, but they've just kept running him and running him, and eventually they, he's beginning to run into form. However, when you say run into form, is it what level of form are you talking about? Because obviously he, he's reversed form. He's, he's, he's beaten a Hoy Senor. Um, uh, sorry, he is a Hoy Senor. He's beaten Noble Yates and Protector Rat in the um, Cheltenham Trials Day. I just thought that that race was just so like drivel, like as in that was an, such a poor race, and I understand it. Yeah, and that's the problem with the Gold Cup is that a lot of trainers don't even run their horses after Christmas, um, and they are geared up for that one run. They may have two runs in a year and then go for the Gold Cup because it does take so much out of a horse. You don't want to have a grueler, whereas obviously he's ran himself into form. But I just don't think he jumps well enough. He's one of those that I could easily see him winning a Gold Cup and just being like he just put it all in on the day, but. He doesn't jump well enough. He doesn't travel as, as well as and as strong as some of the other horses. I just don't think, in my personal opinion, that he's at the level of some of the others in this race. Um, Statler is going to be, I think he will end up as the, the wise guy each way play. Um, he wasn't far beyond Galloping Deschamps, but I find it hard to see how he's going to turn that form around because I think the track will suit him a lot better, staying on and stuff. But he was a national hunt chase winner last year. Um, over the extended trip. So the three mile two is not going to be too much of a concern for him. Um, but has he got the zip and is he as good as his stable mate Galloping Deschamps? I'm not so sure. He could, he's definitely an each way play though. I wouldn't put put you off that. Um, Aplutard, I could not back. Or, or I say I could not back. I've got a thing where generally once the Gold Cup's finished, I'll look at the first three in the market and I'll look to, book, to back them for next year's um, race. Um, just like the, the winner I'd be like okay right bang let's have a look see what price it is if it's like 10 to 1 and I did that with Aplutard but I wouldn't but I wouldn't be putting my, any money on him um, uh, coming into the festival now I wouldn't be doing it on the day even if the vibes are brilliant and stuff like since that Gold Cup run we've obviously seen him and um, we've seen him pulled up in the Betfair well he didn't pull up I think I don't know if he finished the Betfair chase run was awful um, having gone there fresh and won so well and then obviously he was set to run, and then he didn't run around Christmas time, which raised more alarm bells. And I think if Henry is to get this horse to win, it'll be probably the training performance of his career. 
um, because it's so difficult to come off having pretty much had, he's, he will have had one run in six months. And whilst they got him ready for the Betfair Chase Fresh in the past, this is a different kettle of fish. I'm not saying he can't do it, obviously, because Henry's a brilliant trainer and this is a brilliant horse and he was one of the best winners of this race last year. Um, but I just think there's too many question marks. It's not like you're looking at a double figure price. You're looking at eight to one on a horse you've seen once and that was a flop in the Betfair Chase. Some horses never run to the same level after a Gold Cup. And whilst he finished second in the Gold Cup and then kept his form all the way around, maybe he put his all in in the Cheltenham Gold Cup last year and that's what's done him. But I don't know. I think you'd have you have to see it. Um, that brings me on to Noble Yates, who I just I can't have him. Basically, like I, I, I if he won, I'd understand why he won. And if the he- heavy ground comes, I could understand his him getting uh, like being, getting more respect. Um, but a horse that wins Grand Nationals, um, a horse that's travelling those sort of long distance trips, um, he's a good jumper. I think his trainer's done absolutely brilliant with him. Um, but they're good at placing their horse in the right places. And I just think, like, everyone was saying after he got beaten behind um, Hoy Senor, they were like, oh, he stayed on so well. That extra two furlong is going to suit him so well. He stayed on like a Grand National horse because that is what he is. He is a Grand National winner. And for me, I would be, it would tell me more about the field if he was to win than it would, uh, the competition, than would about one obviously hit that would be a phenomenal training performance and he would be an absolutely brilliant horse but the other thing is the fact that um this level of competition for the gold cup can't be there because like i don't think in your next 50 years you'd have a horse that wins a grand national and then comes to a gold cup like they just never normally are at that sort of caliber and whilst the horse is still unexposed um i just thought last time out he was he was just so far back and they have got tricks where they put the blinkers on, take the blinkers off and stuff like that, and obviously steps up a level. And it wouldn't be surprised to me to see him run a big race, but I will be very disappointed if there aren't other horses that are better than him on the day. So that brings me to the two that I've actually backed. So bearing in mind, Noble Yates and Aputard are actually still shorter than Brave Man's Game. Brave Man's Game, I've backed at 22-1 to 1, as soon as he passed King George. Anyone who's followed me for the last 13, well, however long, probably the, in the last 15 months anyway, um, they saw that I put up Brave Man's Game to win the King George and Galloping Deschamps to win the Gold Cup. Um, that double to me was about 50 to 1, but some people on Twitter managed a lot bigger prices with different accounts that I, don't, I can't get. And they had like, they've got 90 to 1. And I've seen the slip since, because obviously on the Boxing Day when, when they won, they, they're like, oh yeah, and showed the slip. So there's a lot of people waiting on Galloping Deschamps. But Brave Man's Game obviously did the bit in the King George. Um, so Brave Man's Game comes here. And like he's a horse that I've, he's he's done me so well so far, um, and I put him up each time throughout, and I put him up for the King George. Obviously, at six to one to win the King George, and many were started to say, "Oh no, Lahon Press and all this," but I didn't waver from Brave Man's Game. My one, I had one niggle going into the King George, and that was, even though you want to back him to say, "Oh no, I think he'll find off the bridle, and he's not a bridle horse," you never a hundred percent know deep down. Like you can understand why people had those reservations. Um, but what he's shown in the King George, like I thought, in my personal opinion, obviously I'm not a jockey, um, I thought he was given a pretty poor winning ride. And what I mean by that is that not only did they line up on the wrong side of La Home Press, so he got jumped into every single chase fence, he didn't take a pull when that happened or move forward, so to get out of the way of that rival. And he also raced like three, four wide. So not only are you wait, racing wide, giving away maximum um, ground, you're racing wide in order to allow that rival to jump into you at every single fence. Like at, after the race and you've won it, then yeah, that's brilliant. It's all happy, happy days and all sorts of like, like it's all hugged together. But during that race, if he was to get wiped out by Lahon Press uh, and they both go down, like he's going to get in there and he's going to get absolutely roasted by the trainer to why he's done that. But you listen to the debrief afterwards and Cobden was so confident. He was riding that horse like he was riding a Wolverhampton one to nine shot, and all he needed to do was make sure he kept it in the clear. He didn't want to get pocketed behind. He didn't want to get put. It was just basically give him a clear sight of his fence um, and stay out of trouble, and that this horse wins. He had so much confidence in the horse, and then when you listen to Nichols afterwards, and Nichols was like, "Yeah, I've told everyone like this and this would win, and all this sort of thing," and you're like, "Okay, so maybe they knew exactly what they had, and they 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 were full full of confidence." Like I was com- confident that he beat Lahon Press because of his jumping issues, but you just never know what's going to turn up on the day. Um, 
but what it showed me that day that made me think that okay the king george uh, the gold cup is definitely a possibility was turning in he began to get nudged off a bridle and i thought the fact that he's traveled the actual distance he's been very wide um i thought maybe this is going to be an issue and this is where he's going to start getting behind what's he going to find and once he started nudging him he found and then he found again and then he drew level with Lahon press and then he and then he came back on the bridle next to Lahon press and that's me when he came back on the bridle i thought hang on a minute what's going on here so he's literally nudged he's got into him a little bit and then he's gone back onto the bridle as soon as he's drew level and i was like wow and then bang he hit the after burners and he was gone and yeah okay he won over 10 lengths in the end but he would have had the right horse finishing second had uh Lahon press not fallen and i'm a bit disappointed that that horse isn't in this race because a lot of people would have seen the form turn around me personally i wouldn't have so i'd have been looking for a match bet to try and get on him to um beat the home press again so for me he's been i don't he's still underrated now like he's sire at eight to one and he's at the same price as he's a bigger price than noble yates who i've said my reservations for that horse our plutard's race once um and he's the same price and stat was just finished behind galloping des champs and was a national hunt chase winner last year whereas brave man games picked up two group ones including the king george this year now, i don't understand what Put it this way to put it into context if brave man's game had, if alaho had done what brave man's game did the way he, exact same race so race wide went up on the bridle came alongside him alaho had done what brave man's game did alaho would be sat in this gold cup market probably about five to two so what's the difference the only difference is the fact that brave man's game is less exposed we don't know he 100 percent says the extra two furlongs but you don't know about that about any of these horses and one thing that i think is very important like as I'll go on to my other selection, very important for Brave Man's game is, like, obviously he won, it was like soft ground at Kempton, is you just don't want to see a bog. You don't want to see him trying to get three mile, two furlongs in really heavy ground. I think the normal good to soft will be absolutely perfect for him. And I think he's got a massive chance. Like, I think at eight to one, I think him and, obviously, my two selections for the race are Gallop and Deschamps that are backed at six to one and Brave Man's game at 22 to one. But I wouldn't put anyone off 13 to 8 and 8 to 1 now. But there is too much between those two in the market. But they're the two horses that I like. They're very unexposed. So, yeah, Brave Man's game, I just think he's got a massive chance. And he's too big a price um, still now. But who come the day, there's plenty of doubters that don't think he'll stay. And he may well not stay. But you could say that about any horse in this race until they've, they've done it. Like a Plutard, you know, stays. But will he run his race? Noble Yates, you know, stays. But he could be... It could be about three chase fences back because he hasn't got the pace to go with these. A lot will depend on the race pace as well. You don't know whether they're going to door and sprint or whether they're going to go hell for leather. So on to the final um, uh, talk is the favourite, obviously Gallop and Deschamps. So there's not a lot I really can tell you that you haven't already seen. Um, in, in reality, obviously last year's uh, County Hurdle winner, um, very, um, it wasn't last year's County Hurdle winner, sorry, I'm getting mixed up with State Man. Um, last year's, um, in effect, Turner's winner, but obviously he didn't win. He fell when he was going to hammer Bob Ollinger. That form didn't look very good in the end because Bob Ollinger's not done a lot since. Um, but Bob was clearly on a going day there because he was, achieved a high RPR and he put 20 lengths between him and the, the rest of the field. But that was literally the last race we saw of Bob Ollinger at any sort of level. Um, he was very impressive in beating Fakir Dudaris over two mile four. Again, you could question that form now, but I thought Fakir ran his race on that day. He jumped, he travelled, and he did everything right. Like the Fakir Duderis we saw against Shishkin on the weekend, he didn't do any of that. So I'm not going to. I don't think you can knock the form of Fakir Duderis, who's a multiple Group One winner over two mile four, um, because on that day he did run his race. He achieved his RPRs. He ran. He did everything correctly. Whereas he never lifted a leg when he he ran on the weekend. Like he didn't jump a fence. He was off the bridle a long way out. So. I think that's a difference. And then obviously at the Dublin Racing Festival is interesting because there was a lot of pressure on town and after some of the rides um, in the past um, and they decided to go complete opposite of what everyone was expecting to with this horse. Like normally when you've got the best horse in the race, you go out in front and you just try and make all. And with Gallopin's buzzy nature, um, despite the fact that he's learning to settle and he was a lot more settled um, in the two mile four race, um, they clearly wanted to teach him again. So it was like a schooling session. So he put him in amongst horses. The downside of this was if the big dog had fallen a couple of uh, yards to his right, he would have wiped Galloping Deschamps clean out, which is why I'm not a fan of seeing short price horses get put in a pack. Um, but what they were clearly getting him to do was to be in amongst horses and get him switched off and then to try and stay the trip. 
Um, and I think they did that, but the only thing was is they got him so switched off that it took him a while to get him going. Like once he got him going, once we got stuck into him, like he was gone, like he was staying and, and he could not pull him up. So the good thing is when you've got a jockey like Paul Townend is Paul Townend will be on again on the day. So he now knows like how much he'll find and when to turn it on. So I think if anything, he probably turned it on a little bit too late because he then he, he was just staying and staying and staying, but he was long gone past the thing. But the beauty with Cheltenham is obviously that straight is so long. Like it's a grueler. Like once they get turned in, if you get pushing coming up around that bend and then coming down the hill, you're going to have plenty of time to stay on. So my only reservation is the fact that he didn't do his normal. We didn't see the exuberant jump in, the like really positive, hard held, double handful, let's go um, sort of like characteristic that's been one of his main strengths. So are you losing one of your main strengths by creating, trying to develop another strength in using your energy for the staying part of the race? So it's going to be interesting because that's one th one thing to consider. But in my personal opinion, I think they probably had Galloping Deschamps maybe 90% fit there. And they were trying to teach him all of these things. And now when you see Galloping Deschamps in the Gold Cup, you'll see both. You'll see he'll be prominent. So he'll be in the first three or four. He'll jump. He'll travel. And when he pushes that button, he'll stay. And I think whatever finishes in front of him will win the Gold Cup. So... I'm not, obviously, he's 13 to 8, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know already. But on the other side of things is, even if Willie Mullins is having a really good week, as I said with the Gold Cup, where normally you don't have to rush in, it wouldn't surprise me if a horse like Galloping Deschamps, you're getting like 2 to 1 or 5 to 2 on the boost on the day. Don't get me wrong, there's no point throwing pelters at me if it comes to the day and he's even money. But there's going to be plenty of people who have got question marks about him, because obviously he hasn't stayed the trip. Um, he did fall last year, so he will have question marks. But for me... Now looking at it, they were the two horses I thought had the most potential at the start of the season. Um, and they're the two I still think. So Galloping Deschamps and Brave Man's Game. I won't be swayed on that. I won't be adding anything to it, even if the heavens open. Like my bets have been long, obviously. My bet that I put on with um, in the 50 to 1 double, obviously that's been on for a long time. And my other bet for Galloping Deschamps in the Gold Cup I did last March. So um, they're already on. Um, and as for Brave Man's game, I think eights is a more than fair price. That You might get bigger with the doubters, you might not, I don't know. Just a lot will depend on how the front end of the market and also with the likes of our Plutard, will our Plutard turn up? So, yeah, so in, in summary for that, those two are my two. Um, I could see a few running well, but I've got my chinks about the others um, and I'll be disappointed if it wasn't. Right, so on to the Hunter's Chase. This one I am only going to touch on short. Fern's Lock is sat there at 6-1. to one. I've got no idea why, because connections have come out and they've said he's not going here. Um, wing leader, they've talked about, um, they've come out and they've also said, yeah, there's a strong chance that um, he's going to go straight to Aintree. Um, so you then drop again and you've got famous Clermont, who won yesterday, who's sevens and is the UK's biggest challenger. And they've said, yeah, he's probably not going to go to the festival as well. So then next is Billaway at tens. And then Chris's dream at 10s. Well, Chris's dream we haven't seen in ages. But the thing is, I say we haven't seen. I don't know what they're doing because they could be winning points to points every weekend. So I can't, I'm can't. i not going to say we haven't seen. I just think the form is very hard with the box hunters. I think Borsalay is an absolute standout um, in the fact that his form was very good last year for a young horse. And obviously that run with Billaway at Punchestown was an absolute war of attrition. Um, and had he not made that mistake, uh, he would have he would have beaten Billaway. But your question mark would be, well, Billamay had just won at Cheltenham, he then ran at Aintree and then come to Punchestown. So was he still up to the same level? Did Borsalay get him on a weekend day? But I think it's very, like this, I think it's David Christie, who's the trainer of Borsalay, wing leader and Ferns Locks, the front three in the betting. If he relies on one horse, which apparently is going to be Borsalay, that tells you all you need to know about this. Because he's mopping up, basically any any hunter's chase that Billaway is not, racing in it's normally one of his runners that wins whether it's Aintree, Punchestown um, or Cheltenham like he is the, the the top trainer for these hunters chases and so I think Borsalay is currently nine to four I've got no idea how that market's going to change I had a small bet on it at maybe 11 to four or something like that which was a pain because um, uh, one of the lads uh, at Racing Lee so if you're not following him he's worth a follow on Twitter very good lad very knowledgeable um, he put up Vorsalay at 6-1 to one on my blog at the start of the year. So he sent me his column. He said, look, this is why and all that. I thought, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm getting on that. Went to it, 6-1. to one. I was like, right, I'll do it. But, and I just forgot and forgot. And then it's one of those 
things where you're just like, oh, I'll do it next week. And then one horse loses it. And then, yeah, and then suddenly here we are. And I, I'm taking just under three to one instead. So, yeah, but definitely worth following at, uh, I'm sure it's at Racing Lee. I'll just double check that for you on um, my phone. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, you really should. Um, apologies. I'll find these two seconds. Very unprofessional, but I'm not professional anyway. At Racing Lee 1. So he had a few winners on the, on Saturday of the festival, uh, on Saturday just gone as well. Had a few double figure winners. So yeah, at Racing Lee 1. So you want to be following him, especially with selections like that, because I wouldn't have been looking at the Fox Hunters chase. So that's a belt that he's picked out. Also, he has absolute standout flames on that form with Billaway. And I think as well, the important thing with Billaway is he's not getting any younger. This will be his, I think this is either third or fourth festival. I think he's finished is it two two one or something like that? So, but he's looked, he he's looked like he's struggling. Like he got up last time out, but he got up. He was sent off one to four, and he was above even money for the race. And I think if he'd not been gifted the inside, he would have struggled to get up that day. But he managed to get up. So Billaway will go there. He'll be the admiral sort staying on. But he got up in a war of attrition with um, uh, Winged Leader last year, just getting up on the line. And I think if Winged Leader could have had it back another day they kind of softened each other up um, by going too soon um, and then Billaway managed to get up on the line it was a winner for me at the time which was brilliant but I think Billaway I'll probably have a couple of quid on at 10 to 1 just as like a, a to cheer him on like as a saver but I don't think he's going to win um, or probably a free bet to be honest so at the moment Borsalay is the most likely winner for me and the fact that you're going to lose wing leader and Ferns Lock out the front of the market and fam famous Clermont the only way I could see him going is shortening but at the same time, when he shortens, I don't know when that will be and what he ends up taking on because I don't know anything about the Fox Hunters forming behind. It's all stuff that I look at and research a lot closer to the time. But Vorsale, if you're looking for a Fox Hunters bet, 9-4 to four is probably fair and the market could cut up if the trainer comes out and says, tomorrow I've took out my two runners because he's already said he's only running one, so I don't know why the market's not reacted further. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. So yeah, I haven't got the sixes, unfortunately. I've got just under 3-1. to one. But I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And there's probably people who know a lot more about um, the Fox Hunters racing. And this race has thrown up some massive prices in the past. So don't be afraid to wait till the day and back like 20 to 1, 33 to 1. I think it's late night pass or something, one at 66 to 1. So, yeah. All right, on to the, I'm going to, well, this is the final race I'm going to cover. I'm not going to do the Martin Pipe just because you're getting all the wise guy horses, stuff like I know the way you're thinking. And everyone watches the race, finishes third, says, oh, that horse looks like a Martin Pipe horse go to the market and he's already eight to one joint favorite langer dan obviously fell um was it last year yeah last year fell shown nothing since back on the same mark so i'll look into that race a lot closer to the time once we've got the weights but the race that i am going to cover is the mayor's chase so mayor's chase uh, as again we'll start from the outside and work inwards um so lma is currently 33 to one uh, i can't have her at all based on what she's shown this year she, for me, and the same with Billaway. I backed both of them the year before, and then I followed up last year, and both of them won last year, but both of them won by scrambling home. And I was over the moon on the time, but I don't think either of them are going to win um, this year. Like, she's been well below form. She was almost pulled up behind um, Dino Blue on her return. Um, so I can't see it. Dino Blue looks like a good horse, but is a two-miler um, and was beaten last time out by uh, Magic Days. Can't see her winning here, and she's obviously been beaten well by Impervious. Uh, tell me something, girl. I actually put her up at twelve to one. I think it was anti post at the start of the season. Like she could run here, but she's just she travels so well in between the fences. But as soon as she hits her, it's like someone puts a brick wall up because she can't jump for whatever reason. She was such a good hurdler, such a smooth hurdler, um, but she just cannot jump. She just does not enjoy chasing. So whether she turns up, I don't know. Uh, Dulce uh, wouldn't be for me. Finished behind some of these already. Uh, Zambella was well beaten by Jeremy's Flame the other day and also could only manage third or fourth last year. Hard to see where she's going to improve from that from. Uh, Gallia de Leto, it sounds like she's going to Brown Advisory. Uh, Magic Days uh, beat the selection. I put up Dino Blue against Magic Days a few weeks ago. Um, I thought Magic Days had everything to suit last time. They, she had two miles, fast ground, unpestered lead. And that was the one thing I didn't want being a Dino Blue backer. I thought Dino Blue would at least pester the lead or take the lead. And the difference was that once she got like two lengths up coming in around the bend, you, you just couldn't eat. She, Dino Blue could not eat, eat into her two length lead. And I think that was her Cheltenham. She may well come here. 
I don't think she wants the extra four furlongs. So, but if she goes here, it's going to be interesting because there's going to be a plenty who are going to be chasing for the pace up front. Um, so, yeah, Jeremy's Flame, I thought she was flattered by how well she won against Zambella. Um, and she's a fair price, though, nines, because obviously she's beaten the best of the English that was Zambella at the time. And looking around, as I said, I don't think Magic Days, I said, doesn't want the trip and a few holes in the market behind. So Jeremy's Flame will probably be the, out, the each way bet. Um, she's still very unexposed, so she could be a player here. I see this as a two horse race all day, as in there's no you're not gonna knock me off this this one. Unfortunately, um we got impervious prior to her debut. We backed her to win that day and to win the mayor's chase at twenty eight to one. So we are in a very good position providing she manages to make it because she won that day and then um she then got well, I say she won that day, she beat Dino Blue. Um and when she beat Dino Blue, she then got bought by J.P. McManus. And as soon as she got bought by J.P. McManus, she was into six to one and all the cogs started wearing and people started thinking, hang on a minute, two and two together. He had LMA, LMA's getting old. Maybe this is changing of the guard. They obviously had a lot of opinion on Dino Blue. If you can beat our horse, then this is obviously a good one. So hasn't moved stables. And thankfully, the jockeys haven't swapped either. So Impervious is still with, um, uh, what is it, Cole Murphy, I think it is. And um, they've done a, a brilliant job so far. Like they went in against the boys last time out. Um, let me just get that. Um, I can't remember the horse that she beat. It wasn't a horse that I'm overly a, a massive fan of. Um, Journey with me, but they pulled so far clear. They they she only she only got up half the length in the day, um, but she had to give the whole field a pound. And bearing in mind, a mare would normally get um, the uh, mare's allowance, and she had to give. Um, all of the field she was racing off 11 1 and they were all racing off 11 she beat journey with me um, uh, half a length and then had 22 lengths back she had Hardor and Manella Kruna I mean journey with me is a 145 horse achieving 151 RPRs so that's not any sort of yoke that's that's a proper horse so when she achieved a 154 RPR that day so these these aren't small times and they're not like she she has got a very leading chance of this put it this way um, Cole Reevy ran a 161, but she was an absolute world beater um, on the first race of it. And obviously she went on to then beat um, Monkfish and one of the other horses that was had won at the Cheltenham Festival. So she was an absolute monster. But last year, LMA ran to a 146 RPR. And the fact that I've just said that um, Impervious ran to a 154. So that's already um, eight pounds higher. And um, and obviously, and that's without even being in the, in the opportunity to run to that high level. Yeah, she ran against the, um, the the males, but she's not running against like a monster, a fellow monster. Like if they get into a proper battle here, she jumps, she stays. And the biggest thing for me is the fact that she she travels really well, but she's very gritty and hard off the bridle. So she doesn't, she's not like, she doesn't shirk a challenge. And that's what is massive in the last two winnings of this. Cole Reevy outstayed LMA in a battle to the line. And then last year, LMA outstayed two or three of them all the way to the line. It was like the best horse, but also you have to find and be gritty off the bridle. And you had to jump and stay. And for me, she looks tailor-made to be... I'm surprised she's not a favourite with her form. Well, I'm not surprised because obviously the other one's trained by Willie Mullins, who's obviously won the first two runners of this. But Impervious has a brilliant chance. And if you've got the 28s to 1, if you took 6 to 1 or any price all the way down, I think you're laughing because I'd imagine that She's going to be joint fabs. They're going to be probably six to four or both six to four or both two to one or whatever on the day. Um, and then that brings them across to Allegoria de Vassi. So she is pretty much the complete opposite profile to Impervious. Last year, she won Willie Mullins' favourite trial for his Mare's Hurdlers. It's a Solarina. So the one Astro Diamond won this year. Um, last year, Allegoria de Vassi beat Brandy Love. So you know looking back now that was Mullins' favourite two like his two that he thought were his two best horses Brandy Love obviously went on to win at the Punchtown Festival Allegory de Vassi was obviously out injured for the rest of the season but Brandy Love is now expected to run this week and run as a massive contender in the Mayor's Hurdle but it shows you the level of what he thought this horse was at with the French form and obviously combined with what he had in his yard so she came out on debut and she absolutely scattered the field she looked brilliant like as in she jumped every ho uh, every fence she was perfect that until the last two the last two she'd been out on her own a long time and would have been say 20 lengths clear the last two fences she pretty much walked through both 
and everyone was just like, oh, and it was quite heavy ground that day, and everyone just put it down to, oh, she's tired, and she'd obviously been out on her own for a long time, just lacking a little bit of match practice. Um, so it was just no issue whatsoever. The concern was her next race. So her next race, when she when she um, returned, she raced at Thurles, and this was on the 22nd of January. She was sent off again a prohibitive price, and she did win by 20 lengths, so it was no real issue. But the, the problem was, was, when she ran down to she ran down to the first, and as soon as she got to the first, she absolutely flew it. Um, but it was like a massive mistake, and went out wide, and it was like you saw Paul Townend clinging for dear life as if he was going to go straight out the side door. And the problem was, is the, I go back to my child in a playground. It was like your kid had just been allowed, said, right, you can go and you can go play with your friends. And she just went berserk. Like every fence, she was clearly loving the job and loving enjoying racing. And she was just going at these fences and absolutely winging it. But the problem was there was no sort of execution. Like you look at a horse and you say you want your perfect chaser. Look at a brave man's game, the way he approaches a fence. And like they measure their fences, they're trying to get as low as possible, as straight as possible, and in the direction that's going to project them to go around following the path of the track. Whereas she literally had zero consideration for anything. She was just like a kid, like just absolutely loving it. She was running and just winging it. And whilst obviously that's fine, like I said, it gets you A to B. She wasn't losing ground at any fences or anything like that. But the problem was, is as the mistake, mistakes start to, as the mistakes start to creep in, like she was going right at her fences. And obviously when the track sweeps around to the left and goes to the hill, like if she's jumping right, it's a bit like the Cole Reavy situation. Cole Reavy was good enough that she jumped right, but she still got away with it. And this horse may still, like this horse has got the X factor, could be the absolute anything, because she she was a brilliant hurdler, whereas Impervious was a, a, like a, a group three, group two hurdler. Like she could have been like top, top level. Like she could be running the mare's hurdle this year, but she always looked like she was going to be a chaser. So she has the X factor to blow this field to bits. But the problem was with a little bit of that jumping right, going around the left-handed track and, uh, the fear for me would be the way she's so excitable and absolutely wings it at her fences. If she catches one of these wrong, it's not going to be you've made a mistake. Oh, just cling on and we'll carry on. I'd imagine she's probably going to unfortunately hit the deck. So, like, I personally, I really wanted to see her out again um, to see her put a much more straight around in. But Mullins has come out saying since, he said, we didn't school her this week. She's come here and she's clearly very buzzy and fresh. And he's used it as a schooling session. But you have to remember, though, this is Willie Mullins. Like, how many horses has he got of this sort of level where he could take them at home and they could send them around fences or have, like, a little schooling race and iron these sort of things out? So as much as I am a massive Impervious fan and Impervious should be the favourite, got all the form in the book and all the right levels, this horse has got proper superstar potential. Like, if she puts it all in on the day and she does jump without giving any ground away, like, if she does what she did on her debut bar the last two fences. So if she does that the whole way around, I think she'll be very difficult to beat, especially if it depends, obviously, like, as I said, if you end up with horses like Magic Days in here, um, depending on whether uh, Allegory de Bassi, whether they choose that they just want to still try and make all, because she did um, make all or was very prominent on Hurdle's debuts as well. So, like, if she, if you knew she was going to, like, if you'd seen, if you knew something, Willie Mullins, you'd seen her schooling or whatever and you knew everything was all right, and she wasn't going to do that. Like she'd be like absolutely bang on, and I think she's got pre proper special potential to um, blow this race apart. But at the same time, obviously we're on. I think Allegory de Vassi was eight to one, and Impervious at um, twenty eight to one. So like, I just hope one of them win, and I'll be really disappointed if at least one of them is not winning. Um, but again, I don't think the market's going to move too much. You might lose the odd runner here or there, but because of how highly they're two very different profiles, but how highly they're both rated. And if you're like a form analyst and you're very strict by the book, you're going to be on the impervious side. Whereas if you're the one who likes to give a little bit of a risk and roll and go for the potential superstar potential, you're probably going to go Allegory de Vassi. So I think I find it hard to see that you're going to wake up on Friday morning and one's going to be like four to five on and the other one's going to be nine to four because the, the opposite will just keep like the punters who are on that side will just bring it back down. So these two could easily be around the, anywhere from, I don't know, six to four to five to two sort of shot between them or even money say even money to two to one sort of thing it's very difficult to see which way it's going but yeah as a, as always all i'm doing is just providing a bit of content and a bit of context of where my head's at with a bit of thought process um i hope you've enjoyed the videos and obviously i understand a lot of the targeted um talking that i've been doing is towards the head of the market it's not because i'm not thinking oh yeah okay that 33 to one shot could run well 
generally people want to hear and talk about the horses that are really likely to run at the festival. So close to the time, um, in like, a, say, a week out or whatever, once we've got handicap weights, once we start getting fields, once trainers say we're definitely going there, you can build a picture and the 20 runners that are entered goes down to, say, 12 runners. And you're like, okay, right, so now you can start looking at the bigger prices. There's no point me sitting here because I'll be here for like four hours talking to you about all the big prices. And then in two weeks' time, half of them don't run or probably the majority of them don't run. So that's why I'm quite focused on the front end. And just remember, I'm just creating a lot of this. I uh, get this through the blog or on the weekends or whatever. A lot of what I'm doing is just creating content to share with other people, things that I read or research or analyze and stuff just to share with people. It's not me saying this would definitely win. And obviously, I put the reason I do my own selections and I do say this is what I've backed is because a lot of people do want to know. There's no point sitting there and watching everything. But at the same time, I could give you all that information. Like, say, on the Triumph Hurdle, I've given you a lot of information on Lossy Mouth, Blood Destiny, and Gala Marceau and said, I think it would be between those three. But you might have heard something that I've said about, say, I don't know, uh, Comfort Zone, and you think, do you know what? I like that one each way instead. And that's what this is all about. It's all about opinions. It's all about you being able to take what I give. And it's the same with the blog. When I provide the blog, the blog will have multiple horses for each race. If it's a 12 runner race, I've probably got seven or eight horses but I may only have bet one horse in the race, but I'm just trying to, there are people out there with not enough time in the day, um, or they don't have the understanding, or they just want a quick flick guide, and that's exactly what I'm trying to create, and what I'm trying to develop here, both through video, and through um, through Twitter, and through the blog, so I hope you've enjoyed all five videos, a uh, quick recap is, obviously as I said, Triumph Hurdle, I think the front three in the market have it between them, the county, um, very keen on um, uh, Filey Bay, and Pembroke, um, Albert Bartlett, uh, not a strong preference currently at the time. Galloping Deschamps and Brave Man's Game um, for the Gold Cup. Uh, Vorselet is the one to beat in the um, Hunter's Chase currently. Uh, Mayor's Chase, unfortunately, between the two at the front, Allegory, Davassi and Impervious. So hopefully you're already on at least one of them and then you can cover with the other. Um, but that's everything from me. I hope you have a great week and I'll be back soon with some more content um, going forward to the Cheltenham Festival. Thank you. Goodbye.